We've talked a lot about file metadata and even file system metadata. And so what we'll do in this video is actually look at the system calls that enable us to examine the metadata associated with our file and file system. Let's start with file system-wide metadata. So we've mentioned that we keep the metadata that describes an entire file system in a block on the disk called a super block, but there are also ways that we can get that information programmatically. And so there are two calls, statfs and fsstat fs, I'm sorry, fstatfs. And basically what those do is you give them a file, either a name or a file descriptor that you're manipulating. And what they do is they return to you a bunch of information that says, here's information about the file system that those files live on. So we'll tell you what type of file system is. Now you might think that this B size or block size will tell you the you know, allocation unit. It does not. Notice that the common is it's the optimal transfer size, which could be different from the unit we're going to allocate in. And we'll see that when we look at file metadata as well. But it tells you important information about the entire file system. How many blocks does it have? How many of those are free? How many of those are in use? And things like that. So if you need information about your file system, that's how you get it. Now that is relevant when you have a file, but what if you just like, I hand you a disk and I say, do something with it. Like how can you possibly figure out even what file system is on it? And so this is where the super block comes in. So if I give you a raw disk and you know nothing about it, you can typically go read that first block on the disk and it will be a super block. And you might have to do some work to figure out what kind of super block it is. So let's take a look at an example. So this is the super block for the Linux ext2 file system. And I know this is a little tiny, you might have to blow it up, but basically it says, you know, here's how many inodes I have on the disk, here's how many blocks I have, and all this information, which is really a superset of what you get from statfs, describes your file system. And so whether I give you a new disk and you're trying to figure it out, or you're actually you know, in the operating system trying to mount that file system and let people use it, this is the kind of information you need because you're gonna to need to know where things live on the disk and sort of how to interpret it. So that's what the kind of information that we put in the super block. Next, let's look at information about individual files, which I think is actually a more common thing for programmers to look at. So there are two POSIX APIs. And remember, POSIX is the standard that describes most Unix or Linux-like operating systems. And again, like we saw with StatFS, the two APIs differ in whether you give it a file name, so that's the stat call, or whether you give it a file descriptor of a file that you already have open. In both cases, what you're going to get back, once again, is a structure that tells you things about your individual file. So for example, here is a stat struct. And what you'll see is the first thing is a device that actually identifies the physical device that this file system is on. You're gonna get the inode number. So that's that unique index that describe that, that sort of represents the file internally, right? Users don't like integers, but systems really like integers. So an inode is basically a unique ID that says this file. You get a mode which corresponds to the um, permissions that we saw in open. We have this link count, which is actually a number of names that are associated with the file. And when we talk about naming, that will make a lot more sense. You get to find out who the file belongs to, the groups, things like that. And then there's some in important information about like how large the file is. So we get a size. We also get a number of blocks that have been allocated to the file. And you might think that you could just derive one from the other, but in a moment, I'm gonna show you that that's not necessarily true. And again, like we saw with the file system, you get this block size, which is the optimal transfer unit. So I wanna talk about why you need both a file size and the number of blocks allocated to a file. First of all, you might recall that we talked about sparse files. So a sparse file might have a really big size, gigabytes or megabytes. But in fact, one of the beauties of a block-based file system is that we don't have to allocate that whole file. 
So in that case, we might have very few blocks, but the size would look enormous. So that's one reason. And I'm gonna show you examples of these in just a moment. The other reason is that you might have extra metadata blocks that you have to allocate with the file. So those won't change the file size, but they will in fact change how many blocks are allocated. Finally, what if you have a one byte file? By now you should know that a one byte file is probably still gonna allocate a whole block. So if I tell you your file consists of one block, you don't know how many bytes in that block are actually valid. So you need to know like how many bytes can I read because the rest of it is really, it's, it's internal fragmentation. It's not really part of the file, but it has been allocated to the file. And then finally, as I mentioned, depending on how we represent files, we might have extra metadata like indirect blocks that should count towards the block count of the file, but not necessarily the size. So let me switch and show you some programs that are available in the code repo. And so you can experiment with these as well. So ideally you can see this and here are the files in the directory so we can build them. And I've got a little program that will build us some files. So let's build some files and then I wanna look at them. And the ones you wanna pay attention to is something called tiny. So what you'll see is that tiny is really tiny. It consists of one byte, but notice that we've allocated four somethings to it. And so the question is in what unit are these reporting? And I'll tell you, they're reporting in kilobytes. So there's actually four kilobytes that were allocated for this teeny, teeny, tiny one byte file. Okay, we have a medium sized file, which is 409600. So we allocated about 100 4K blocks. And so we get 400 allocation units. And now the more interesting one is sparse. So sparse looks like this enormous file, but in fact, notice that we've only allocated eight blocks to it because it is in fact a sparse file. So let's see what my stat will tell us about these files. So basically my stat, let me just show you the code. There's nothing particularly, let's keep this in a good place. Okay, so all we're gonna do is we're gonna give it a file name we're going to call stat on that file name, and then we're gonna print out some interesting information about the file. And notice I'm running this on my Mac. You might get slightly different numbers if you run this on your laptop or on the student machines. So let's run my stat on tiny. And what we see is that the file size is one byte as we saw. Now, when we did LS, it said it were four blocks, and that's because LS was reporting in one kilobyte units. Stat is going to return this block count in units of 512 bytes. You might say like, why 512 bytes? That's a really weird number. And the reason is really historical. You might recall that I said that disks used to have 512 byte sectors. And that was true for about 30 years. And so it was very common that when we talk about file systems, many things were described in terms of sectors that were 512 bytes. Even though that's not true anymore, much of our software is still written in terms of sectors. And so at least on this machine, when we talk about block count, what you're getting is the number of 512 byte chunks and those no longer correspond to sectors. Kind of weird. Okay, and here the block size in fact is matching the allocation size saying I allocate things in 4K and I'm claiming that that is the optimal unit of transfer. If you run this on the student machines, you'll see a very, very different number for block size. And I would encourage you to do that. So that's our tiny file. Now let's look at my stat for our medium file. So this one, the file size is in fact, you know, a little around 400K, in fact, exactly 400K. Um, and its block count is 800, again, because we're counting these 512 byte sectors. And again, its block size is 4K, not very interesting. But let's see what happens when we call my stat on sparse. And here's where we see that in fact, the file size is huge. Now the block count is 16. So what does that mean? All right, a block count of eight would be one 4K block. And a block count of 16 says I have two 4K blocks. And so what I've really done is I've allocated one block at the very beginning of the file and one block at the very end of the file. And all that space in between that you can read and get zeros from 
is actually not allocated. So it's not consuming disk space. Okay. I encourage you to play around with these. They build quickly. You should have fun. Let's go back to the slides. Okay, and we had just finished our digression about the difference between size and number of blocks. And I hope that those utilities will give you a chance to understand that a little more deeply. The last metadata structure I wanna talk about is something called a directory entry. So we're just getting into the part of this unit where we're gonna talk about how we represent the symbolic names that you and I associate with files in contrast to these, you know, bizarre integers that are inode numbers that you and I really don't want to deal with. And it turns out that one of the beauties of the way that hierarchical namespaces or these folder structures are built is that we can impose structure on top of a file. So we can allocate files just like we do for data. But what we do in order to create a directory structure is that we impose a structure on those files that we can then interpret as names. And so there are some library calls, opendir and readdir, that let us examine the contents of a directory. Okay, so utilities like ls that I was just using actually use these calls to get the directory structure to tell you what files are in one of these directories. So let's look at the structures in a little more detail, and then we'll go back and look at some sample programs. So here's a directory structure. So what a directory is, is it's just a collection of these structures that are layered on top of a flat file. And so for each entry in the directory, what you get is its inode number. You get a length of the amount of space I need to allocate to represent this particular structure. You might say, well, aren't structures all the same size? And you'll see in a moment that they're not. Okay, you're gonna get a file type, and this says see below, this is from the man page. And so the type is gonna say, this is a regular file, or this is actually yet another directory, right? Because you can have folders within folders. And I'm gonna use the term folder and directory interchangeably here. So this says, what type of object is this? And the ones you should be most concerned with are really file, directory, and then what we'll talk about quite soon are something called um, symbolic links. Next, what we're gonna do is say, okay, so, so this directory entry corresponds to this particular inode whose number I gave you, and it has a symbolic name. Maybe you called it cat or dog. This is how many bytes do I need to represent the name? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually put the name in the structure. Now, if I made all the structures fixed size, then we would take exactly the same space to store the file whose name is A, from to store the file whose name is my very long file name with a lot of characters that you don't really care about, but it's really big and it's gonna take up a lot of space, okay? You wouldn't want to allocate the maximum size for every single file because most file names tend to be pretty short. So what happens is that this name says, here's how many characters we're going to use to represent the name. But then because we like data structures to be aligned on boundaries, we're going to then pad out the data structure to a multiple of four bytes. This is, sounds a little confusing. It'll become a lot more clear in class when we start to draw pictures. But you need both the name length to tell you specifically how many characters at the end of this structure represent the name. And then you need the record length to say, okay, what's the total size of this record, including any padding that I'm adding. Okay, so that's what the directory entry structure looks like. What we'll do is we'll actually implement a little program that uses opendir and readdir to examine the contents of a directory. So like the other system calls you've used, you go to the man page, it will tell you which includes you need. And I've added assert here because instead of doing proper error checking, I often will use asserts to make sure we still catch errors, but it's a little more concise. So what we do is we open a directory so I give you an argument, we're gonna open the directory and you're gonna get a pointer. And that pointer you can think of as a handle and what that handle lets you do is read the directory entries in order. So what we'll do then is then we'll use the reader call here. Oops, yeah, clicking on that was not such a great idea. Okay, in fact, let's just switch to the terminal right now because we have the program there as well. Okay, so. 
whoops, that was the executable. That wasn't what we wanted. There we go. Okay. So this is a slightly cleaner version. Again, we called opender. This time we'll do proper error checking since it's not on the slide. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate using this handle that I got from opender over every entry in the directory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to report the inode number and I'm going to report the name. Okay. And so every time I go and call reader, I get another directory entry. And then when I'm done, I'll get a null back. So let's run dir read on the current directory. Okay, so what this says is in my directory, I have some files which you saw before. So this is the directory, same one we were using. And then I have these weird directories, like why do I have these entries for dot and dot dot? Well, it turns out dot is the name of the current directory. So that's why commands of the form dot slash dir read work. What that says is start in the current directory and look for the file called dir read. And so when I look in the directory, it says, ah, I have an entry for dot. I know who that is. And then it looks and it says, oh, and there's actually a program called dir read as well. And so that's the object that I'm looking for. So that's what dot means. What does dot dot mean? Well, what happens if I do ls dot dot? Oh, look, I'm in a directory called preclass. Hmm. What does that mean? Ah, well, here is the whole path to where I am. How did the PWD command figure that out? Well, actually, what it did is it kept saying, OK, what is my parent directory or dot dot? So dot dot says, go up the file system tree. And so it said, oh, dot dot is preclass. Then I can say, OK, if I'm in preclass, what goes up from that? And it calls dot dot. So dot dot is how you go up. So in fact, the name dot dot slash preclass is equivalent to the current directory. And in fact, I could call dir read on dot dot slash preclass. And you'll see that it gives you exactly the same thing as if I read the current directory. So dot and dot dot are these two special names that we actually insert into every directory. And as you see, here are the inode numbers, which are these big random numbers. And I'm guessing if I told you that the way you were going to access files was by these big random numbers, you would be sad. And so it's this directory naming structure that actually helps us apply symbolic names. So this is sort of a high level overview telling you the system calls and the library calls that let us manipulate file system metadata. We'll talk more in class about how we then take that metadata and really build all the functionality that you're used to in a file system. So look forward to seeing you in class.